Welcome to the Alts Insights Podcast, a look at the latest trends we're seeing in the alternative investment universe. AI Insight covers over 300 non-traded alternative investment funds and alternative strategy mutual funds, along with over 1,000 closed programs. Hello, I'm Mike Tell, Senior Vice President, Program Management and Business Development here at AI Insight. And I'm joined by my counterpart, Laura Sexton, Senior Director of Program Management, to discuss our most recent private placement industry report for December 2020. And we'll also touch on uh, kind of things we've seen uh, throughout the year and uh, 2020, knowing this is our year end uh, podcast. Um, just, you know, at the highest level, uh, if you would have asked me uh, in Q2 or the end of Q2, or heck, even in Q3, how we're going to make out for the end of the year. I would have probably said we were going to be down about 10% uh, year over year. And surprisingly, we closed out, uh, and I'm not even including the, the, uh, us initiating coverage on, on any public programs, but just on the private placement side, we, we had a record year, year over year. We came in, uh, included, we, we have some, uh, some restricted offerings where, where they're proprietary to a, a particular selling firm. Um, or, or whatever that might be. But but ultimately, we came in at 209 total private placements we initiated coverage on in in 2020, and last year was 207. So certainly not a sizable increase year over year, but just considering when we were down almost 40% in, in new coverage just in Q2 alone, and for us to be able to rebound and come out uh, – anywhere in the black year over year was absolutely blowing us away. So, so we're, we're very excited about that. Um, and in just a minute, obviously I'll hand it over to Laura and she'll go into a little bit of detail of, of how things broke out there. Um, and, but then the other point uh, from a data high, highest level data is December. When we look at just December, uh, December, 2020, we had 32 total uh, new programs. We initiated coverage on all private placements and that was our single largest month ever in the history of AI Insight. Uh, and the prior one was 31. So again, not, not sizable by any means as far as uh, increase over a prior uh, top month. But, but for us, the fact that, that we had a single biggest month was, was last month, the month of December, and they were all private placements as well. So, um, so great things. I mean, I mean, great to see the industry rebound, especially after Q2. Um, you know, COVID obviously is still a thing, uh, but capital is still being raised. Uh, new opportunities are still being brought into the market. New, new investment managers are coming in, trying to capitalize on, on at least the perception of, of opportunities um, and actual opportunities, certainly depending on, on how you look at things, whether you're a buyer or seller, I guess will determine that. But uh, but ultimately, a number of new opportunities. So great things that that we're seeing from an industry perspective. Obviously, uh, uh, President-elect Biden, uh, the official, uh, will be inaugurated here soon. Uh, regardless of uh, uh, you know what side of the line you're on, um, he, he's our next president, and uh, and certainly it's no surprise here that that uh, that means 1031s once again will be in focus. Um, there's no guarantee that they're going away. Uh, they, they, they've been a focus for a number of years. Uh, we, we continue to work with uh, some of our great industry partners on bringing a lot of that positive data to the forefront and getting that out um, to, to educate the, the um, congressmen and women uh, on the 1031s and benefits of them. We we'll continue to work on a big project there to, uh, to support those efforts. Um, because 1031s play a, a big role, especially on our coverage here at AI Insight. Uh, but uh, I'll hand it over to my uh, counterpart, Laura, here to go into a little bit more detail on, on what we have seen in December and, uh, and a little bit uh, kind of throughout the year in 2020. But uh, thanks again for, uh, for, for listening in. Laura? Yeah, great. Thanks, Mike. And, and I think I want to – I'm going to go over some of our coverage stats and things like that. But before I do that, I think I want to kind of – talk about, you know, the trend that you were talking about, Mike, about, you know, the growth in private placements. I mean, we really, as we're looking at what's happening in the markets, it's definitely a trend over the last several years that's been happening, movement of capital from the public markets to the private markets. It's certainly not a new trend, um, but I think, you know, the COVID, um, re COVID related recession has definitely amped up that trend and, and we're seeing more and more 
of the sources that we look to um, reporting an increase in private um, capital moving from the public markets to the private markets. So, I mean, we reported last month in our private placement insights that reports by both Prequent and Deloitte had forecast private equity AUM to increase anywhere between 55% and 60% through 2025. So that's a significant increase over a five-year period. Um, but the, you know, the COVID recession really highlighted the benefit of private equity ownership, um, which, you know, as we all know, tends to have a little bit of a longer time horizon than the public market, allows for more flexibility, faster adapt adaptation to changing trends. Um, and so there was another recent report by um, PwC that talks about it and talks about how, you know, the flexibility of private capital will be even more important going forward. As you know, we've seen consumers and, and you know, us as consumers, we're, we're, we change a lot. So, you know, the consumers change the way they live and work, especially with, you know, things um, changing to, you know, remote work and kind of who knows exactly what the final kind of live work situation is going to look like after this all plays out. So, you know, the, the thought is that investors are going to place even more value on companies that can really quickly adapt to new patterns uh, and private equity you know, as opposed to public equity, which kind of is focused a little bit more on each quarterly financial result, um, private equity tends to have a longer term view. Um, and, and so that allows for a little bit more flexibility in what management can do in a company. So, you know, even even further kind of, um, you know, acceleration of the trend from public to private. Uh, and and uh, the PwC report that private equity deals were actually up in 5% in 2020. And what's interesting, too, is that this is despite the fact that valuations in many industries didn't decline um, like it did in the Great Recession. You actually saw a lot of company valuations um, stay steady um, and some even increased. So, um, you know, a lot of a lot of private equity capital moving from the public markets to the private markets. I think it's a trend that we're going to continue to see um, and, again, accelerated by the, the recession. So kind of switching back to our coverage, I mean, we cover as of right now, we cover 167 private placements currently raising capital, and those funds have a, a target raise of $17.1 billion, um, and they've reported an aggregate raise of $8.6 billion, or 50% of target. So those are the funds that are currently raising capital. Uh, in, in real estate funds, including the 1031s, um, Opportunity Zones, and non-1031 real estate LLCs and LLPs that still represent the largest component of our coverage. That's so about 75% of the funds that we cover and 60% of the raise are, are related to real estate. Um, private equity and debt funds definitely have seen an increase this year. I mean, they're up 83% in terms of um, new fund coverage over the year and 316%, actually almost 317% in terms of the aggregate target raise. So it's a smaller amount of funds um, in terms of our coverage, but definitely those tend to be bigger funds and they represent 32% of our aggregate target raise. So um, that's definitely, you know, a market-related, COVID-19 market-related increase that we've seen there as, as um, those funds have been kind of gearing up to, um, you know, to, to invest in some of the companies uh, that need help related to COVID-19. Um, so in terms of our coverage by general objective, I mean, income has, has kind of always been the largest component at about 52% of funds um, and private placements. So, you know, more than half of them are focused on generating income. Got about 28% uh, focused on growth, and about uh, and that we've seen that grow actually this year. A little, little, few more funds focused on growth as the kind of, you know, the the opportunities around the recession um, focus a little bit more on growth, uh, and then growth in income is about 18%. The average size of the funds currently raising capital is 102.3 million, um, and it's a you know very big range, anywhere from 1.9 million for a small fund to 3 billion for a big private equity and debt fund. Um, we've had 55. So another thing that happens a lot, we, we see um, a lot of turnover in private placements. So they tend to have shorter lifespans than the big um, public funds. And we tend to see about as many funds close um, their offerings each year as we see open. So um, in 2020, we had 209 private placements that closed. Um, that closed their offerings, still, you know, actively managing, but they've closed their offerings. They they were on the market for an average of 299 days, and they reported that they raised 71% of their target on average of those that reported. Um, you always have some funds that don't report their capital raise, but if those that they were, that reported, they reported 71% of of target was raised, um, and 70% met or exceeded their targets. 
and only 12% were able to raise less than half of their target. Um, we did have seven funds that were suspended um, suspended due to COVID-19 and one that was terminated. Um, so, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the market dynamics that we've seen. And, and I think, you know, one of, one of the things, so one of the other areas where we've seen some growth is in energy. We haven't had any funds added to our coverage over the last couple of months, but, in, you know, Q3 and early Q4, we saw a decent increase in energy. We've seen very little over the last couple of years, and this year we definitely saw an increase of, you know, 20% increase in the number of funds added and 36% in terms of the aggregate target raise. And, and I think it's an interesting topic. I mean, I, you know, obviously an incredibly volatile year for the energy industry. I mean, you had the WTI, um, the price of oil as represented by the WTI, start the year at $65 a barrel. Um, and then it fell to just over $10 a barrel and, and just due to trading things actually had gone negative technically um, for, you know, about a day. But really, you know, when you look at kind of the price and the real price that people would pay, it was $10 a barrel in April and then back up pretty quickly to the 38 to $42 range. And then towards the end of the year rallied, um, kind of, you know, broke through that ceiling and, and now, um, you know, trading about $50 a barrel. Um, and the 2021 forecast is about $65 a barrel by year end 2021. Um, so, you know, oil and gas deals, there's a report um, by Pricewaterhouse Cooper that oil and gas deals fell by 40% in 2020. Um, and 80% of the deals that did happen occurred during the second half of the year. They were primarily large um, kind of mid to upstream deals. So that's similar to what we saw. We saw, you know, a little less earlier in the year than we saw Quite a few, actually, in, in uh, you know the second half of the year. Um, and uh, but the the PwC report, you know, says that there's probably going to be continued continued co uh, consolidation in the in energy industry, and especially, you know, will be interesting to watch with the new administration coming in. But another thing I wanted to discuss here was um, I was just listening to a podcast from Energy Prospectus Group. Uh, their speaker Dan Steffens discussed how the energy industry is primarily impacted by population growth. And the number of people using energy. So, so this is a really interesting topic. I mean, in, in his discussion, he had some charts that that showed that you know, despite COVID-19, the global population continues to increase um, as it has, and, and pretty much exponentially since the mid uh, mid 1800s. He said there's a net 200,000 people added each day to the planet. So, um, you know, that's that's really interesting. And he said additionally, the world's population um, is expected to increase. From 56.2%, their world's urban populations, so as you know, people living in urban areas, expected to increase from 56.2% now to 68.2% by 2050. And again, this is despite this kind of shorter-term trend that we're seeing, you know, a little less urbanization, more to suburbs. But in general, that trend is expected to increase, and a lot of that has to do with kind of China and India, and you know, two two of the centers of population in the world. Um, so really interesting you know, data out there. And, and I, I also wanted to mention something I've, you know, I've been to listeners today. So read or listen to the book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth by Robert Gordon. It's really interesting. Robert Gordon is a social sciences professor at Northwestern. And, and so John Grady, who's um, one of the incoming board members at ADISA, suggested this book. It's really fascinating look at think, how things have changed for humans over the last 150 or so years and, and kind of help, helps explain this population growth. That you know is kind of driving energy demand and and you know all the things we're seeing now. It's it's you know it's really interesting. It talks about some of the innovations during the last 150 years that we sort of take for granted, um, but you know really have have had an impact on on the human experience. So sort of a little bit of a side note, but I would suggest reading it, and it does sort of you know the pieces come together on why you know why the population is growing so exponentially after this time period, and and really that impacts everything. It impacts real estate. It impacts energy. You know, all these things that we're talking about, um, you know, really, really has a big impact. So um, and, and I guess the last thing I'll touch on is real estate. I mean, the, you know, clearly real estate markets very impacted by COVID-19 in 2020. Um, uh, you know, the, the initial data for Q4 from Moody's Reese indicates that um, vacancy rates increased and average rent declined in all the key sectors. I mean, apartments, office, retail, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are overall vacancy rates increased and rent declined. Um, one of the things they pointed out, though, is that the overall numbers were actually less severe than what was anticipated um, and less severe than what occurred during the great financial crisis. So certainly a huge impact on real estate, 
but um, a little bit less severe than what was thought. Um, but there are more significant differences than there were. So a lot more bifurcation this time than even the last time around the, the last recession. You have a lot more bifurcation um, that with you know significant differences in the metro areas. Um, and, and what's really interesting um, is just how some of the main markets saw um, such steep declines while some of the other areas actually saw increases. So within the apartment sector, for example, Reese reported that um, many metros, I mean, some of the kind of smaller metros saw effective rent growth of 2% or more. So, you know, cities like um, like Indianapolis, um, you know, some of the smaller market cities saw growth, while New York and San Francisco saw rents, this is apartment rents, decline 12.2% and 14.9% respectively. So that's a record for both cities in terms of, you know, rent decline. So really interesting things going on. Um, you know, private real estate pricing, has yet to reflect the impact of the recession. Um, you know, NACREF, uh, the latest reporting period is Q3. So um, as of the end of Q3, overall real estate, real estate prices were actually up 2% year over year, but per performance was bifurcated. I mean, hotels were down almost 23%, while industrial was actually up 10%. Um, and, you know, PwC just reported recently the consensus for overall real estate market valuations is, is for a decline of anywhere between 5 to 10% as a result of COVID-19. And, you know, the, the question is how long does it take for that all to play out? Um, the public real estate markets interestingly finished down the year 2020 at um, down 7.9%, which is kind of in the middle of that anticipated 5 to 10% decline for a private market. So kind of interesting that the public markets sort of read it and, and have, rep you know, responded already. This is interesting. This is one of the worst years for the public markets. They're down. They, they underperformed the S&P 500 by 26%. So significant underperformance of real estate this year. Um, so anyways, that, that's sort of what, um, what I've got in terms of the market update, Mike, and, and you know, all kinds of interesting trends and, and things going on. Um, you know, again, uh, lots of um, the funds that we've seen are definitely focused on, you know, looking at some of the opportunities that have been created um, related to COVID-19 and, and uh, certainly seeing more of that happening. And, and one other thing to mention is the conservation funds, so conservation easements, conservation contributions. We definitely saw um, a little bit of an increase the, there and even more so focused on year end. So usually, um, you know, these funds would come out kind of the second half, late Q3, early Q4, but this year, the majority of the funds were actually in the last month of the year in December. So we saw a lot of con conservation funds open um, later in the year, even more so than prior years. And, and that, that probably has to do with COVID-19 and kind of some of the market disruption earlier, but, um, but certainly more, even more back-ended this year than they were before. So uh, I think that's it this, this month for um, what we've seen going on in the private placement industry. And, and, you know, thank you all for, listening again. I hope everyone is safe and healthy and, and uh, we will be back in February. Thank you.